Does that, does that look better? Hey, what's up guys? Fish Tank Mike here, back at the two experiment tanks with experiment number two. So if you didn't see, the first experiment was kind of a little bit of a failed one. That'll be at the top link in the description. There's that playlist with all the experiment videos. And if you're watching this in the future, hopefully there's like a million really cool experiments. So make sure you check that out first. So experiment number two, super simple, super cut and dry. One tank had CO2 and the other did not. And I don't know if you guys can tell, but the tank that had CO2 was this one, tank number two. The tank that did not have CO2 was tank number one right here. We need to thank Waterbox Aquariums once again for supplying us with these two 16 gallon tanks that we have side by side here. They're rimless, they're low iron, they're high clarity, and it makes taking pictures of the comparisons for whatever we're doing in the two tanks really nice. Make sure you guys check the link in the description for Waterbox Aquariums. Check out all the different tanks that they have, fresh water, salt water, whatever you're into. Let me go ahead and lean back. Oh, jeez. <laughs> so you can look at the two tanks. Let's try that again. Let me go ahead and lean back so you can really see these two tanks, guys. Um, it's very obvious that carbon dioxide helps plant growth tremendously. And it's even kind of hard to see. Does this help with the flashlight? Not really. Okay, well, but before we start to look at graphs and the, you know, picture every day kind of time lapse of these two aquariums, let's set this up a little bit better so you have a, a better understanding of what we did here. The first thing we did was chop the two aquariums down to roughly the same level. Remember, we were using this tank for a different experiment. The plants had grown at variable rates in both of the tanks. So we just tried to start as fresh as possible by chopping them all down to the same point. At the time of doing that, there was CO2 being put into both of the aquariums, so we simply removed the CO2 line from tank number one. So in these two aquariums, the only difference was that tank two had CO2 and tank one did not. Both of the aquariums had 13 neon tetras put into each one, and both aquariums got exactly 0.2 grams of fish food per day for a 30-day period. You're now looking at these two tanks roughly 60 days in. I just wanted to see what this tank would do a little bit longer term and nothing really big happened or anything crazy. So uh, we're about to start our third experiment here now, but I just wanted to show you guys what happened. To measure the amount of CO2 that we were putting into tank number two over here, we did that in a couple different ways. One, we looked and we counted the bubbles per second coming out of our diffuser. We also have these liquid drop checkers in both tanks that are actually a pH indicator which are going to turn green as the CO2 approaches roughly 30 parts per million. They turn yellow if they go over that 30 parts per million and into the 40, 50 range. And that's when we know we have a little bit too much. In this experiment, we did go over that 30 parts per million or that green marking into the yellow, our fish were just fine. This is more of an advanced course. Uh, if you're new to planted aquariums and you know about CO2, CO2, then you're probably going to be able to handle this video, but just in case you're brand new and you have no idea why we're adding CO2 to the aquarium, um, I'll put some links in the description to kind of speed you up a little bit and get you up to where we're at. And so let's go ahead and just dive into it. Let's now just jump into that time lapse, guys, and let's check out the evolution of these two aquariums over that 30 day period that we took a picture every day. One thing that did kind of get in the way, like the first experiment, was the cloudiness came back in tank one. If you guys happen to watch that first video, you'll remember that tank one developed some cloudiness, and we suspected it was probably just a bacterial bloom. It eventually went away naturally at the end of the experiment, and as we started this first experiment, things were all good. It did come back though, and it was around for pretty much the entire experiment. We did one 8.8 gallon water change, we'll show that in the graphs here in just a second, um, but even after that water change, towards the end of the experiment, it did end up coming back. Something that I did do, and let's see if we can, I have it right here, props on hand. We did add some of this Fritz clarifier to this tank. We added one dose appropriate for the 12 gallons that this aquarium is, and it completely resolved the problem. So most of the time we always say, you know, try and resolve things naturally. It's always the best thing. We don't want to be always putting band-aids on things, but sometimes you can do a treatment one time and it just kind of corrects the problem. And we don't really have any more insight into why that is than 
just seeing the results for themselves. So, so while I don't always 100% of the time recommend the use of band-aids, stuff like this, a flocculating agent to help remove particles that are clouding your water, or you know something like uh, something that, like an algicide, right? You want to try and fix the problem naturally, but sometimes just a one-time use is enough to knock something down and, and keep it gone for good. So don't always throw that option out. And again, it's been a month since the experiment ended and since we added that flocculating agent and that cloudiness has not come back at all. Let's now put up the graph that's measuring nitrate and phosphate. That was the one thing that we were measuring as this experiment went on for roughly a 35 day period. We're looking now at the graph of tank number one. This was the tank that again did not have CO2. We measured for nitrate and we also measured for phosphate. Not every day, but kind of, you know, as consistent as I felt we should throughout the experiment. So you're going to notice that as the experiment went on, the nitrate increased in the aquarium. And my theory for why we saw nitrate building up in the aquarium is just the typical one that is always assumed. It's that if you don't have a high demand for that nutrient, being nitrate, then it's going to build up in the aquarium naturally. You can see that at around day 30, that concentration dips way down. That's because we did an 8.8 .8 gallon water change on this aquarium. You'll notice that a few days later, that concentration started to build back up again. These are all totally normal things, things that I expected. But what was really interesting was that we never detected any phosphate in the water column throughout the entire experiment. A building phosphate concentration over time is something that we often associate with overfeeding or just a natural byproduct of adding any amount of food to our aquarium. We did notice a little bit of green spot algae on the front panel of glass of tank number one, which is something that we do associate with a phosphate limitation in the aquarium. Now, what we'll notice once we get to tank number two is that there was a lot more green spot on that tank, but I just wanted to throw that out there now. Throughout the entire experiment, we added the same fish food. This is the micro pellets by Hikari. Uh, I just like the size of it for the fish. This is a food that I've been feeding for a long time. It's not particularly good or better or worse than most other pelleted fish foods or processed fish foods out there, okay? These are all filled with a lot of just inorganic bad stuff that ends up turning into waste in our aquarium, okay? So there's nothing special about this food, but it is something to say that we didn't have any phosphate buildup over that 35 day period of time feeding this food. So here's the graph of tank number two, guys. I know you've been waiting to see this thing for the entire video. Look at how interesting this thing is. I'm obviously joking because there isn't anything to see on this graph. We were never able to detect phosphate or nitrate in the aquarium that had CO2 going to it at all at any point during the experiment. Honestly, this is a result that I was expecting to see. I've seen it in other tanks that I've kept in the past, planted tanks of course, where we're adding CO2. We typically can't detect any nitrate and it's my opinion that that is mostly because the plants that are using the CO2 are consuming the nitrate. Now, of course, there's more at play in our aquariums. We have vast microbial communities in the substrate, on plant leaves, on all surfaces that are contributing some to the consumption of that nitrate and the phosphate and all the other things that our organisms share. I just really wanted to demonstrate with this experiment to show you guys that adding CO2 has more of a benefit than just making plants grow. The fact that the plants are growing Growing because of the CO2 is also keeping your water safe for your inhabitants. With respect to nitrogen, at least, from what we can see with this experiment, this result ultimately proves to me how valuable our substrate is. That has to be the place where these plants are getting the nutrients. If they didn't have anything to pull on, they wouldn't grow. We know that there's really nothing in the water column as far as the macros go. We couldn't detect any nitrogen. We couldn't detect any phosphate. Those are really important building blocks and plants shouldn't be able to grow like this if they don't have access to them. They clearly do, and they're, to me at least, clearly coming from the substrate. The last thing I want to say about tank number two, guys, is that increase in green spot algae, a significant amount more on tank two than we saw on tank one. And if you remember back, green spot algae 
a lot of the times is a sign of a severely phosphate limited or phosphorus limited aquarium. The fact that we did see way more green spot on tank two just goes to show you that it probably was more phosphate limited than tank number one. Even though we couldn't detect it in either tank, that's just a test kit resolution problem. These liquid test kits are not gonna really tell us how low that concentration is. You would need a much more robust test to be able to see that. For the most part, all of the aquarium plants in the tank that had CO2 did grow more than the plants over here in the tank that did not have CO2. Something that you guys should keep in mind though is that this is only a few different types of plants. We use several different stem plants to really show the effects that the CO2 or you know whatever the treatment is might have on plant growth because stem plants just do the best at showing off growth rate. Um, but things like the S repens, we did get more carpeting in the tank that had CO2 versus over here in the tank that did not have CO2, we got less carpeting. You can see we still have an open area here, whereas these plants, it might, it might be kind of hard to see over here on the CO2 tank, but those plants did spread out um, towards the center of the tank. The S repens over here in the non-CO2 tank also were a little bit more leggy compared to those over here in the CO2 tank. And even if we look at two stems here, comparing directly, you'll notice that just even the individual leaf size on each one of these stems is very, very different. The tank that had CO2, there's a lot more biomass. The leaf size is a lot larger. The plants are a lot more red. And I thought that was kind of interesting. You know, we think of redness in plants being a direct link to having iron in the tank, either in the water column or in the substrate. We do have iron in both of the substrates in this tank. We didn't add additional iron, like laterite or anything like that, but there is a little bit in this Brightwell nutrient substrate that's down here. And I think that's the main thing that we can take from this experiment, guys, is that the substrate is obviously contributing a massive amount to the growth of these plants along with that CO2. There's no added nutrients to either one of these tanks, and there certainly are nutrients down in the substrates of both of these aquariums, CO2 being the only factor. So CO2 along with the light driving the uptake of nutrients, most likely from the substrate because we're not detecting it in the water column. Even though over here in tank number one, we were seeing a growing concentration of nitrate, that obviously wasn't something that was contributing a lot to the growth of the plants in here. There was obviously too much in the aquarium. The plants and the microbe communities in here didn't have that much of a need for it, hence why it was continuing to get higher and higher as time went on. So anyway, guys, I mean, that's the CO2 experiment in a nutshell. There's not much more to say about it. Um, just keep in the back of your mind all the limitations that come along with a study like this. We talked about those limitations in the previous video um, where the experiment didn't go really according to plan. So check that out if you if you really want to you know, learn as much about this stuff as possible. I'm trying to showcase it in the best way possible, um, but it's kind of like I shoot this, I go and edit it, and I go, okay, well, maybe, you know, that's not super clear, I need to change that, and then it kind of, I, I don't know, it almost makes the video more confusing to me at least. So, so what I'm gonna do beyond making these videos is I'm also gonna write up a little blog post and have that on my website. So there'll be a link somewhere in the description for that as well, guys, if you wanna go and check that out and really sit down and like, get this in a in a readable format. I know a lot of people learn and absorb information um, better that way. Um, other people do better with videos. You know, everybody has their own thing, but it also helps me to write that blog post and really frame that information. So anyway, check that out, guys. I hope you like the series. I'm excited to start experiment number three. I think you guys are gonna like it. And don't worry, we're not gonna always be doing high-tech stuff. So all you guys out there that have uh, low-tech tanks, we are gonna look at some low-tech situations here very soon okay so anyway thank you so much for watching guys and we'll see you in the next one hit that like button baby